Welcome everyone to the second meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Everyone is reminded please to switch off your mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. As meetings are provided in digital format, of course tablets may be used during this meeting. We have received no apologies because everyone is president. Agenda item one, discussion, uh, decision on taking business in private. The first item today is to seek the agreement of the committee to take agenda item four and any future consideration of its work program in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. No. Can I just, just before we do agree on that, um, could you just make it clear the reasons um, for taking the work program in private? Because I think it's important that the public knows why we take issues in private. Um, because I, I think at that stage, uh, Mike, the important thing is to have a free discussion and therefore we can w identify what our work programme is without constraint and then make that available for everyone to see exactly what we're doing. Thank you. So item two uh, is then to hear evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for the rural economy and connectivity on the range of issues within his portfolio which relate to the committee's remit. And we are going to ask the Cabinet Secretary to actually define that remit or his remit so that the committee do understand exactly what, what their role and his role is. Um, it's hoped that the session will provide the committee with an overview of the key current and forthcoming projects, policies and initiatives and developments by the Scottish Government. And I'd like to welcome Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity. I'd also like to welcome his supporting officials, Donald Carmichael, the Director of Transport Policy, David Barnes, the Chief Agricultural Officer, and Trudy Nicholson, the Acti Acting Deputy Director for Connectivity, Economy and Data Division, all of whom are from the Scottish Government. I would invite at the outset the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Well, thank you, uh, Convener, and congratulations on, on your uh, assumption of the important post of Convener of this committee, and a welcome to all the members of the committee, some new and some not at all new. Um, I, uh, I'm very pleased to appear before the committee as the new Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity. The First Minister, on appointing me, urged that I drive forward the rural economy in Scotland, and as someone who's represented a constituency which, in geographical terms, is largely rural, and have done so for 17 years, I'm absolutely determined to fulfil that role. Rural Scotland is the home of many diverse small businesses. It's the source of uh, so much of what we eat and drink. It's the foundation of our green energy revolution, and it's the cradle of much of the culture, the history and the landscape that are integral to how we as a country views our, view ourselves and also to how we are viewed by others who invest here, increasingly in, interested in investing in rural Scotland. And it's important to say this, it's also the home of many from other countries, including EU countries, and they are all most welcome. My portfolio spans many of the key industries which make a, a difference, which is the backbone of the rural economy, of, of agriculture, of fishing, of crofting, of aquaculture, of forestry, of field sports, of food and drink, and also of services which are vital to the rural economy, namely transport and connectivity. And I'd like to begin by saying a few words about progress uh, with the issue which has occupied a great deal of my time, and rightly so, over the first month of my tenure, namely cap payments, and separately on the outcome of the EU referendum. On cap payments, as I made clear, convener, in my parliamentary statement on the 31st of May, resolving the current CAP payment situation is my immediate foremost priority, and I'm pleased to be able to update members on our progress in fixing it, Balanced payments worth over £60 million went out over the last weekend. Further substantial payments were made yesterday and will be made today and tomorrow. I can now say that most farmers and most crofters should have received most of their due payment, but anyone who is not in that position should already have received a substantial loan payment 
unless they chose to opt out of the loan scheme or their claim was ineligible. Payment performance this year has, convener, fallen short of the very high standards that the government has delivered in recent years. We are learning lessons and we'll do a full review. However, the overriding current task is to get the last of the payments out to farmers and crofters. I've said I will return to Parliament in the autumn uh, 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 to report on our progress uh, on objectives for CAP payments. Uh, I would also be happy to come back to this committee to discuss these lessons with you more fully and crucially what we do to minimise the risk of these happening again. I'd also like to say a word about the EU referendum. The European Union provides and has provided significant support to Scottish rural communities. Uh, it's a key market for our food and drink we produce. The majority of Scotland's overseas food and drink exports worth £1.9 billion went to the EU in 2015. Last Friday I was at the Royal Highland Show where I spoke to many, many people. Most people to whom I spoke on the Friday when I attended were shocked by the referendum result. Uh, it creates greater uncertainty for Scotland's farmers and crofters as for other, all other sectors of society. But we are st still firmly in the EU. Trade and business should continue as normal. And we are determined that Scotland will continue now and in the future to be an attractive place to do business. For now, everything continues as normal in terms of the systems that are running. The cap regime remains in place and payments continue to be made. The First Minister is taking all possible steps and exploring all options to give effect to how people in Scotland voted to secure our continuing place in the EU. She also made clear that the government must be fully and directly involved in all decisions about the next step that the UK government intends to take. And moreover, we will be seeking direct discussions with the EU institutions and its member states, and that work has begun. On Monday of this week, I attended the Agriculture and Fisheries Council in Luxembourg and met with the French, German and Irish ministers, uh, and also with EU Agriculture Commissioner Phil Hogan, and I raised the concerns about the farming community in Scotland, and I had the opportunity to stress that we are open for business, working to protect Scotland's role in the EU. And it's vital that other nations understand Scotland's position and just as vital for our farming and food industry that we work quickly to safeguard the links and relationships that benefit them when it comes to trade. In conclusion, I look forward to continuing to take part in vital work with the EU convener and to working very closely with yourself and this committee as it takes forward your programme of work. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that statement. Uh, as we go into some questions which, which we'd like to ask you, I wonder if I could start off uh, and ask the Cabinet Secretary what, what proposals the Scottish Government has to address the challenges of living in rural areas in Scotland. Uh, well, as, as uh, we both know, Convener and many other members of the committee know, living in rural Scotland, that we, we enjoy many, many advantages. We live in, uh, in beautiful landscapes. We have strong communities and strong community spirit and community activism. We have higher economic activity. We actually have lower unemployment rates generally than uh, those living in, in cities. Uh, and it's no surprise, therefore, that there the various indices show that uh, a great many people are, are very, very satisfied with rural living, but there are many challenges and there are many pockets of, of uh, poverty uh, and significant rural deprivation. There is a low wage economy in some areas and some sectors. That's a feature of some of the sectors. And these, are, of course, uh, are matters where we're working in partnership. Our support for the establishment of the rural parliament has allowed communities to identify key priorities. And indeed, I was able to engage with, the, uh, uh, with uh, people behind the rural parliament at the Royal Highland Show. We're investing over 80 million pounds in community-led local development across rural and coastal Scotland to build social and environmental capital through the implement of local strategies. We are working with stakeholders to review the Fuel Poverty Action Plan, including the Fuel Poverty Eradication Target. And this will include recommendations from the Rural Poverty Task Force and Working Group, both due to report their findings by the end of, of this 
calendar year, we will make the most of new powers being devolved by extending the eligibility of winter fuel payments to families with children in respect of the highest care component of the DLA. Uh, and uh, we are exploring other ways uh, to issue payments early for eligible householders who are off-grid. A uh, very serious challenge for many people that live in rural Scotland, and I know many members, including Mr Mason and Ms Grant, have raised these issues uh, a, a ad infinitum. Uh, so, quite rightly so, I should say. So, you know, these, these are just some of the issues, convener, by no means all. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list, but just some of the issues. So, there's definitely a curate's egg of a great many people who have terrific uh, lives, fulfilled, busy, active lives with relative comfort, but matched with a significant number of people who do not enjoy that. And that is a real challenge for the rural economy, and one which, working with colleagues who have primary responsibility for driving forward the anti-poverty measures, we will, of course, be determined to challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got a question from Peter. Thank you, convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you, we, we all know how difficult the, the last six months, at least, have been for the farming industry, not least because of the debacle with the, the IT system and the fact that it's, it's proved to be uh, you know, not fit for purpose. Um, uh, then we, and we, we know there was a scathing report by the auditor in, in, uh, which highlighted poor management and poor overview and uh, you know conflict of interest and you know a, a, a system that is uh, you know has not been proved to be fit for purpose and it has caused real problems. I'm I'm pleased to hear that the balance payments are now going out. Um, that was one of the big concerns, obviously, that uh, the last bit of the payment was obviously going to be the most difficult bit to, to achieve. So now that we're doing that, that's great. I would just ask, are we, are we, is the Cabinet Secretary still confident that there will be no uh, EU fines coming along down the road because they, you know, we know that the, the deadline has been put back to the 15th of October for paying 95%? Are we confident that we can uh, at least achieve that and that there are no possible EU uh, fines coming down the road for the, you know, the Scottish uh, Government? Well, I think it's a fair point that Mr Chapman makes, uh, convener, that there have been very difficult times for farmers. Uh, there have really been times when all sectors of farming have had s severe financial pressures, or almost all uh, sectors, but that has been the case over the last period. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that as at the 28th of June, Payments have been uh, uh, initiated to over 16,400 farmers and crofters, and over the past week we've injected a further £67 million into the rural economy by making balanced payments to over uh, 13,500 businesses that have received a first instalment. Um, since I came into this post, convener, this has been the number one priority. I said that on the 31st of May. That is what has happened. I have sought to do everything within my power to take this by the scruff of the neck and get the money out to the farmers for 215. That has been the first priority. We have substantially achieved that. However, every day I receive individuals, individual emails from farmers to which I reply myself, passing them to uh, David, who, will come, who, who can answer any technical questions. But I'm confident that the hundreds of people working throughout the country, busting a gut to get these payments out, have really played a blinder for Scotland, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank them uh, for the terrific work they've been doing to transform the system since I came in uh, and uh, really deliver a marvellous effort. And I think we would all recognise that many of the people in these offices are themselves of the farming community, uh, whether they are working or have an interest in a farm or have relatives that do so, and they care passionately about doing this. Uh, regarding penalties, uh, I, I think that we uh, have made a great progress. I think it should be said, convener, that, uh, 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 that uh, there has in the past been a history of, of relatively modest penalties in the scheme of things at the Scottish and UK level. In other words, it's not the case that there have been no penalties incurred uh, in relation to the administration of these payments. There have been. Scotland's record until this year was significantly better, I think it's fair to say, than other parts of the UK. This year that hasn't been the case. But I can say that uh, we will make a detailed statement about this when we come back to Parliament in the autumn. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I am very confident that the worst predictions of the Auditor-General will not come to pass. 
So I'm happy to provide that assurance. But I think it would be better, since we're not actually at the deadline yet, uh, uh, for some purposes of 30th of June, that uh, we postpone you know, a, a detailed consideration of this matter until perhaps after the recess. I don't know if David Barnes wants to add anything of, of whether I've covered everything at this point. Okay. Um, just, just before we go any further, can I just remind committee members uh, that uh, if they have any interest to declare, it would be useful just to briefly declare them. And I, I'm sure uh, Peter would have wanted to declare that he was an interest in, in a farming partnership. Um, but if, if, if we take that, that that is now declared, uh, but if it comes up again, I would ask uh, members just to... to uh, well, thank you, convener. I, I, I accept your rebu rebuke. I should have said that I have an interest in a farming partnership and I have an interest in, uh, in uh, directorship of uh, Aberdeen and Northern March Group and I have an interest in a, a wind farm company as well. And I apologise profusely. It, it slipped my mind to say that. Um, any having any that has farming interests or having difficulties with their cap payments, then please do contact me and I'll do what I can to speed things up. Uh, okay, can, can we go to uh, Mike, who I think has a question for you. Thank you, convener. Minister, you're quite right to reassure the farming community, the agricultural community, that nothing will change over the next couple of years as far as subsidies and that sort of thing. But, but in two years' time, when we're leaving the common agricultural policy, um, in two years' time, you are likely to have entire control personally uh, over farm subsidies for the future. Um, the issue of if you could say something that might reassure people in the long term about farming subsidies, because there are going to be issues raised like pig farming, dairy farming, don't get subsidies. Those people will be thinking that maybe with the freedom that you may now have that you might want to change the system. So I'd like to know what your initial thoughts are. I know there's a long way off yet, but what your initial thoughts are on this whole issue if we have total control of the money that goes out in subsidies. Sure. Well, that's a very fair question, and it was one that was asked by, uh, obviously, by the specialist journalists from the Scottish Farmer and so on uh, a, on Friday of, of last week when the, the shock of the news was uh, being considered by everybody. Uh, and uh, I think, in, in principle, I would want to make absolutely clear that the Scottish Government recognises the huge contribution that the financial support payments make to the rural economy as a whole, and to farmers and crofters in particular. Uh, that is part of the existing system. It is, uh, it is a system that we support, uh, and in principle, therefore, we need to be able to provide whatever reassurance we can to farmers and crofters, and also those in local authorities and others who are involved in rural programmes, which are uh, the Rural Development Programme, which uh, in itself is a, a massive programme between 214 and 220, uh, that we will continue to provide a, a ballast, a financial support that has been a key part of, of supporting rural life. So I can give that in principle commitment. What I can't do uh, is to give any assurance as to what we've received from the UK government I have no idea what the UK government's view on this is. I do believe that points were put to the UK government prior to the referendum as to whether there was a plan of any sort. Uh, so far as I know, there was no plan B, uh, unless B stands for the Christian name of an individual. Uh, so there's no plan whatsoever that uh, we have been presented with by the UK government. But I don't really want to go into the politics of the thing, because I think really what what people that live in the rural communities want is facts and assurance as quickly as possible. Uh, and that will be difficult to provide because, of course, if the terminus are quo of the Article 50 trigger is not going to be until October, then by definition, since uh, it's been indicated that there will be no informal talks by the Commission, if that is stuck to, if that position remains, then it will be quite simply factually impossible to provide more, more information other than... Uh, in response to Mr. Rumble's question, a clear statement of principle from the Scottish Government that we must continue to provide the ballast of economic support to the people that are the backbone of our countryside. So I give that support, that principle, principle commitment, but I regrettably, for circumstances that I think Mr. Rumble's and myself both deeply regret, just at this moment in time, we cannot go much further than that. But we will, of course, be exerting pressure on the, the UK government
to come up with answers quickly. And lastly, I would say that you know, the EU is a reserve responsibility. And therefore, the funding responsibility to fill the reserve function follows the nature of the fact it's reserved. There is, there is a, a lack of a devolved capacity here for the budgeta budgeting facility, which is entirely a reserved function. The, e e the EU recognised the UK as the member state, and the member state speaks on agriculture and is responsible for finance. So it is for the UK government to come up with clear proposals. It is primarily, as a matter of simple law, their responsibility, and I urge them to do so as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you very much, convener. I... Uh, thank you, convener. I, I just wanted to pick up on the IT aspects of uh, the cap payment that uh, uh, Peter uh, Chapman raised and I, I will say I do have with my wife a registered agricultural holding of the massive three acres and we receive no cap payment so I don't think it's relevant to the discussion uh, but I've said that on the record for, for anyone who has an interest. Um, I, I spent uh, three years lecturing on uh, computer project management to postgraduates at Heriot Watt after retiring uh, from 30 years in IT and before uh, being tapped on the shoulder to come here. And I used two projects from the public sector uh, as our course uh, projects. Uh, one was the uh, Scottish Qualifications Authority debacle of the early 2000s uh, and late 90s and uh, an earlier one 10 years back, the London Ambulance Service. So I think it's quite clear the public sector uh, is not terribly good at big IT projects. And I think that's quite independent of political leadership. Um, the private sector is not necessarily any better, by the way. You just don't hear about it, and you probably don't want to. Um, but I just wonder, Minister, whether there is an opportunity for across government, the government to consider, in the longer term, uh, setting up an expert panel to look at the generality of how we manage uh, large IT projects. Now, I know the Auditor General is doing intensive uh, look at uh, how the project was managed, but I think there's fundamentally more to it than perhaps the Auditor General may be covering. And I would encourage the Minister to be quite positive in his response to me um, that we might take this and possibly create uh, world leadership on what is a problem that's pervasive in the industry that I used to make my living in. Well, I have no immediate plans to be involved in world leadership. I'm going to be focusing largely on the cap payment issues in the short term, at least. But, uh, but no, I think Mr. Stevenson, convener, has, uh, it's too modest to mention, but he was involved in the implementation of a, a new IT system for a major bank in Scotland, as I understand it and was told to do it on budget or on time uh, in, I think, a two-sentence remit, and he implemented that. So, you know, I, I think, uh, speaking from experience, and uh, I think it's a fair comment that governments on all sides of, of, of all borders, frankly, seem to find it difficult to implement IT systems on time and on budget. There are many reasons for that. I did notice that the Auditor General, in her report on the CAP issue, did say that she is uh, preparing uh, wider comments on IT generally, and I think that's to be welcomed. Uh, so I, I hope to be engaged with the Auditor General and colleagues across government, and I would therefore respond to Mr. Stevenson's question in the positive spirit that, that he mentioned. I think there are certain basics, though. It seems to me that one of the problems with IT systems is that the specification is not properly defined in the contracts, uh, perhaps because it hasn't been thought through uh, uh, or for other reasons. Another problem is communication of the IT system to those who have to operate it. That's a particular problem in relation to agriculture because the IT system was operated by a set of experts and the people who are administering the system uh, are experts in, in the CAP system and how it operates. And they are, they are truly expert uh, in how it operates in great detail. However, they're not IT experts. Therefore, I think, and this was identified by the Auditor General in her report, that the, one of the particular problems was the difficulty of people in the 17 area offices, three of which I visited uh, and spoken to staff at great length about this, that they did not feel comf confident in the IT system and the solutions uh, may not have been properly communicated to them. Uh, these matters uh, became evident to me in the first couple of days from the job 
and steps were taken to address that, uh, and I think that the, the steps have had relative success. For example, ensuring that the people who are able, the, the top people who are able uh, to communicate how the IT system should operate are able to communicate that directly to the senior staff of the area offices. And there's various ways to do that in management terms, but uh, these, the, these steps have been taken at my behest since the 20th of May when I was appointed to this role. But I entirely accept that Mr. Stevenson has raised a, a useful suggestion, uh, and I will take that back specifically to colleagues. Uh, and uh, if I may, I'll report back and I will write to you, convener, as to what the official government response is, because plainly it, it, uh, it cross-cuts a number of directorates, including this one. I know Stuart's keen to come back, but if, 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 you, if it's very, very quick... It's quite quick. No, very quick, because it's a big issue and there's lots of questions stacking up around the table. I, I, I would just suggest, if I may, a convener, uh, that the Minister has perhaps illustrated one of the issues. You cannot complete the specification at the sign of the contract. It's just not possible. If you have, the project dies because it is an essential part of projects that there is change. If there is not change, the project's going nowhere. And the important thing is not so much to nail the specification down as to nail the process for dealing with change. Uh, and uh, to quote Ovid, ad parvum parvum magnus acrovus erit. In other words, add a little to a little and there'll be a big pile. And that's from the Mythical Man Month by Professor Fred P. Brooks 40 years ago. It's still valid. Um, I, I think we'll take that as, as said, if I may, and move on to, to, to Emma, if I may, and then come to Peter. Okay, it, it's a question related to what Mike Rumble said about the EU, and it may sound local to <coughs> Dumfries and Galloway, but it actually has national implications. It's about last year, Dumfries and Galloway secured £5.6 million of EU rural de development funding, and it was the highest allocation in Scotland. So I'm hoping the Cabinet Secretary can um, maybe clarify or just uh, tell us a little bit about whether this may be the last EU money that the area receives and what uh, comment he has or any reassurance that the UK government has given to replace it through the block grant. Well, I, I think in a way, Convener, um, Emma Harper's question is just a variant of Mike Rumble's question, uh, and the answer is the same. You know, uh, the, the payments that have been received, and she mentioned the figure in Dumfries and Galloway, are plainly essential for the farming community in that part of Scotland. As I learned when I visited the Dumfries area office, uh, I think in the first week of my, my tenure, they cover, incidentally, an enormous swathe of Scotland, enormous land, land area. Um, but, uh, of course, it is essential that payments continue. Um, if she suggested that there will be no more payments, that is not correct. I mean, we, we are still in the EU. We're bound by the rules. That will remain for at least two years, plus whatever period uh, elapses prior to the, uh, to the, the terminus a quo of the two years, the trigger. Uh, it may be in October, in which case we've got a further two years in the EU. I would have thought that, you know, the the date of exit from the EU, if that's what uh, the UK government decide to trigger, would uh, coincide with a financial year. <laughs> but, uh, but, but who knows? Um, nobody can be certain about what the UK government will do in these matters because we, they haven't sold us. Uh, but there will be a further couple of years where we are still in the, in, the, uh, in the EU, plus a little bit at minimum. There could be a lot longer if the trigger is not exercised for some time to come. Uh, again, we don't know. So I think this, this illustrates very clearly that Ms Harper has raised on behalf of her constituents a matter that is of extreme concern. There's a complete absence of clarity at the moment, and it's useful that this, the proceedings of this committee can highlight the, the practical need to demonstrate to farmers in Dumfries and Galloway, as in the rest of, Scot uh, of Scotland and the UK, just how important it is for some real progress to be made uh, from the, the UK Treasury in making some clear statement of intent, which I would expect will, uh, would have to be issued in the next uh, few days a, 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 a convener. That would, be, that would be a personal view. In other words, these questions that are being asked today in this committee are being asked everywhere in Scotland and everywhere throughout the UK. Uh, and no sector is more impacted than the farming sector because it is the area where the EU has 
pretty much total responsibility, legislative responsibility for the administration of the payment system. If you look at other sectors of the economy, it could be argued that they're less directly affected, although they all are reliant on a single free market and free movement of people. But the farming sector is different. It rel relies almost entirely for the revenue of the people that work in it on EU payments. And that's why I'm very grateful, and I think perhaps many members may share my concerns, when, whatever party we're in, that the lack of clarity is dispelled, ended, and certainty is brought forward by very clear statements from the Chancellor of the Exchequer as quickly as possible. Uh, this is, is an important subject, and I, I'm mindful of the time, but I would like to take one more question, and then maybe if I, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Barnes a question myself. So if we go to Peter to start with. And I, I just want to follow up on in, in my initial question. I mean, uh, and uh, I would also like to say that although I've been very critical of the IT system, I have never been critical of the, the, the people in the area offices. I know the people in the area offices have done their, their utmost to, to make their system work under very difficult circumstances, so the, the criticism has never been uh, uh, pointed at them. But I just ask the Cabinet Secretary whether he can, at this stage, say more about the process of learning lessons from the problems of the IT system, and whether he will be able to give farmers a firm timetable for the making of the payments of 2016. <coughs> Um, OK, well, as far as learning lessons uh, go, I, I've said that, that uh, we, we obviously recognise that there's, there's an essential need to learn lessons, there's a need for a review. Um, I have had a number of discussions with civil servants about this. We have, I think, made improvements to the management system, to the control system, to the reportage system, um, and um, all of this will have to be looked at in detail in due course. Um, a, in addition to that, we need to learn the lessons from the people that are most closely involved. When one wants to learn how to do things best, ask the people that are doing it at the coal face. In this case, uh, there are, for example, convener, several professional agents who around the country uh, are professionally employed by farmers to complete the necessary forms because a, they are complex, and B, the consequences of making an error, even an inadvertent, obvious, innocent error, can be absolutely swinging. So uh, I think that uh, it's essential that we learn from those who are involved in it, and there is an agents forum, uh, and I'm going to make arrangements to meet with the agents forum to get the benefit of their advice, make sure that they in input into this. <laughs> I, I'm bound to say that the response of the commissioner uh, Phil Hogan has been exemplary. He has responded, and in fact, uh, I met him uh, 30 minutes before I actually became the Cabinet Secretary, uh, before I was sworn in, and he reassured us uh, at that meeting that there would be good news to follow. There was. He acted swiftly. Uh, and it does ironically show, actually, just how helpful and the EU flexible it can be in some circumstances. So, uh, uh, so uh, that's important. And also say that the, the real flaw of the EU cap payment system is the way in which it does penalise in, inadvertent errors. And I've known this as a constituency MSP for 17 years, and I'm sure colleagues will have seen the same thing, that the fines meted out or the loss of support payments for a simple lack of a tick in a box or a, a discrepancy, a minor discrepancy with a few ear tags, uh, the consequences are so horrendous as to make, I think, all of us feel that this is just not right. Uh, and one of the few examples in society of a manifest, clear, palpable injustice. Now, I mention that because Commissioner Hogan has been taking through the council proceedings, and I attended one of them on Monday, the yellow card system, so that this, this form of, in, the, of uh, entirely disproportionate punishment comes to an end. And I do, I just mention that, Commissioner, because I think it's important to recognise that uh, the EU doesn't get a lot of credit for some of the things it does because it doesn't really hit the radar of the press. But in this instance, Commissioner Hogan has delivered in relaxing the, the penalty compliance regime, and I think he's also in the course of delivering for fairer treatment from farmers. Uh, so uh, it, that, that, uh, these, these two factors will obviously be relevant for the lessons learned process that, that Mr Chapman quite fairly raises this morning. I, I did ask about 2016 payments, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you haven't answered that bit. 
uh, well, that's perfectly true. Uh, I will bring forward, as I promised, uh, a, a proposals in the statement that uh, I promised to make and I will make after the recess. Uh, and the, the reason I can't do that now is because we've been busting a gut to get the 215 payments out. Uh, but I can assure Mr Chapman and all the committee members that we're, we're looking carefully at 216. Uh, and can I just say this? We cannot have a 215 again. It will not happen again. I'm determined it will not happen again. And that's the starting point. And everything else flows from that. And over the summer, I will be ensuring that when I come back to Parliament, I give a statement that is convincing, robust, and tackles the problems which have uh, so bedeviled and beset the farming communities with real stress and pressure over the past few months. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I, can I now, before I ask my question, just make a declaration that I have an interest in a farming partnership um, and I, uh, within that partnership, um, Cabinet Secretary still await my payment, so there's no doubt that uh, uh, where, where, where my position is. So that's clear at the outset. But could I just ask the Cabinet Secretary if it's possible, please, to come back to the committee, if it's not possible, to give the information today on the total costs of the IT system the extra staffing costs, because I believe up until after Christmas, some 75 extra staff were taken on. I believe that number may have increased. And I believe that the extra work that the Cabinet Secretary alluded to that had been undertaken by the staff in the offices uh, by the end of February had, had exceeded uh, 2,500 hours. Um, so that we know what the actual cost of this has been uh, to the purse in Scotland. And, and, and therefore we can move forward on that. Uh, well, I think that's a perfectly fair request and uh, it's one that we will comply with as, as soon as we can. I prefer to wait if, until we've sort of broken the back of the 215 payments and I'm confident with that, but, but I will certainly come back as soon as I possibly can with, with answers to that. Um, but of course, uh, you know, I would say that it's quite right that there has been overtime. Overtime has been necessary in order to make sure that we break the back of getting the payments out. When you've got a job to do in the private or public sector, then overtime is, uh, is a fact of life. Uh, so, you know, I make no apologies for uh, insisting that the managers of area offices throughout the country do everything they can to get the job done, even if it means a bit of overtime, although I fully accept that means some extra cost. But we will come back to the committee with details there and end. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the next question is going to be from John on, I believe, on crofting. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Uh, yes, I would like to ask about crofting, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Now, you will be aware of a, a number of controversies at the moment um, in, involving senior personnel and indeed the issue of commons grazing. And clearly, I, I wouldn't anticipate that you would comment on any live proceedings. But are you able to give a general view on the state of crofting and perhaps tell the committee about plans to reform crofting law, which has seen to be very complex, um, and did say how the, the uh, national development plan would be put together, please. Uh, yes, uh, well, that's absolutely a fair question from Mr Finney. And, you know, starting off, I want to just express our support for crofting in Scotland. It, uh, it, it is a unique form of tenure. It's part of the history and culture of, uh, of uh, parts of the Highlands and Islands, uh, and we want to keep that. Uh, and also, active crofting means that, that people can be sustained on the land uh, in the most remote parts of, uh, of the Hebrides. I know Rhoda Grant has uh, always been active in campaigning for crofters. So first of all, I want to make a commitment that uh, we want crofting to continue. Um, secondly, I had, prior to the referendum, been involved in addressing the stakeholders of a group that are looking specifically at the issue of the move from less favoured area to areas of natural constraints in 2019. A, a, and that good work, that good work was prefaced, of course, on the continuation of the EU. Uh, but that good work was informed by the full participation of uh, the SCF, the NFU, and with many individual crofters uh, whom I know and had the pleasure of meeting again. I also met the SCF at the Royal Highland Show and indeed yesterday again. So uh, first of all, we support crofting. It will continue. 
Uh, it is not under threat from the Scottish Government. Uh, and secondly, to answer the other questions, we will bring forward legislation. Um, I, I, I am keen for the committee's input in that process. It will be an open process. Uh, I think it should cover areas such as sustaining housing, uh, looking at the existing mechanisms of, of grants, looking at other possibilities such as the loans scheme, looking at how commercial lenders can actually grant mortgages on Crofts, for example. Uh, the, is there a way that that could be done by, by a slight amendment to the law? Uh, housing is absolutely imperative, of course. A great deal has been done, both by this administration and our predecessors, to be fair. It's a shared belief that crofting is a valuable part of our heritage, so the uh, other parties have, uh, have been supportive as well, which I recognise and value. Um, I can't, as Mr Finney says, comment on existing live cases, one of which may be before the um, relative tribunal at the moment, but I am aware that there is disquiet amongst many crofting communities, many of whom who have written to me. So although I can't make any specific comment, I can say that I'm seized of the issue. I'm aware of it and I'm looking to have and I'm having uh, and will continue to have discussions with all relevant stakeholders, uh, including the Crofters Commission, uh, who I expect to meet fairly soon. Um, so uh, I, I hope that, that Mr Finney and his party, as I expect they will do, will play a full part as supporters of crofting uh, in how we, we continue with the form of tenure, the way of life, supporting it, seeing in what ways the Shucks, Shucksmith reforms, all of which, not all of which have been implemented, uh, which of those might be taken forward, and in what other areas the law should be changed. I am no, no expert by any means. Uh, there ain't many experts in crofting law. Uh, there is a crofting law group, of course, who we will also consult. But I, I'm very keen to address the immediate, the immediate concerns of the crofting community in an appropriate, in an appropriate way, uh, in due course. Uh, but I think that the matter is effectively sub judice at, at the moment. So just of today, I can't really comment on that further. But. Uh, but I, I very much look forward to working with Mr Finney, his party, and with uh, all members, really, in the task of uh, further bolstering and strengthening our support for the crofting communities in Scotland over the next five years. Uh, sorry. Yeah, if, you, if you'd like to come back quickly. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. An another uh, brief question, if I may, that, again, you may be restrained in what you can say. I'm due to meet the Chief Executive of the Scottish Rural Colleges tomorrow, and about the facilities at the crofting community, the farming community, indeed the public health sector uh, um, in the north of Scotland have uh, an interest in is the transfer of the facilities from Drummond Hill and Inverness to UHI, and whether the facilities will be like for like. Are you able to comment on that, please? Um, well, I did meet with uh, the SRUC chairman and chief, chief, uh, chief executive very briefly at the Royal Highland Show last Friday, and I wasn't able to have any detailed discussions. I have asked, uh, I think, through my office for clarification. I should say I am the constituency MSP for this, so I, I have two, two hats here, and I have to be careful uh, I, about the handling of this. Uh, but uh, I'd be very keen to ensure that uh, the solution that is provided to the loss of the post-mortem facilities at Drummond Hill uh, with the planned welcome plans for replacement post-mortem facilities in, I think, uh, the Beechwood campus, the UHI, uh, will be plans that will be seen as uh, sufficient uh, in every respect in terms of the operation of the post-mortem facility and the, rel the relevant backup staff and facilities. Uh, and I'd be very happy to work with Mr Finney uh, in order to assure that objective, which I believe has, has been uh, an objective to which the SRUC have given their support. So um, I'm happy to continue a dialogue with Mr Finney on that matter. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, I'm grateful that um, Cabinet Secretary is going to look at crofting law, but can I suggest that there is maybe a need for some very quick action dealing with the worst um, parts of the legislation. I think the 2010 Act has caused a lot of the problems that we're now seeing manifest themselves. So can I maybe suggest some quick action, putting right some of the wrongs, but a, a broader look at crofting law on the round and simplification going forward. But that will take time, and we've got problems here and now that need to be dealt with. So I maybe just leave that with him. Um, he'll be aware um, the Crofting Federation had asked five actions on crofting. Um, as part of their manifesto in the election. And I 
believe um, that the SNP had accepted those five actions. So one of the actions was about crofting development, and he'll be aware that crofting development was transferred to um, to, to high, um, and that became crofting community development, not actually crofters development. Now, a lot of individual crofters have received no development funding since then. Is he giving thought to how you actually help crofters develop their businesses and how they can access that money and indeed if that function would be returned um, to the Commission? Well, first, first of all, um, you know, I, I know that Rhoda Grant has, is uh, steeped in crofting and has been an activist in pursuing this over a number of years, quite a lot of years, I think. So uh, I'm very happy if she wants to write to me setting out specific proposals, then I'm very, I would treat them obviously with, um, uh, treat them very seriously and I'm happy to meet with Ms. Ms. Grant in order to, to take that forward. I think we've come, probably come from uh, a shared general approach about uh, many of these aspects, so I just wanted to say that. Um, uh, secondly, we have in our manifesto, our party's manifesto, promised to reform crofting law and we, we will do that. Uh, but we need to give careful thought about the way we do that. So I'm not, I don't think it would be wise to make sp specific commitments today. But obviously we, we, have, re we have regard to, to timing issues when we, when we, um, when we consider that. Um, a, thirdly, we, we do provide a great deal of support for, um, for uh, crofting uh, in various ways. Um, 4,000 crofters claim cap subsidies, for example. Um, in the new Croft House grant in, launched in 2016-17, there's 1.4 million of annual assistance, helping to build or improve approximately 35 to 45 Croft houses. So that, I think, would be in the category of going directly to individuals rather than the general point which Rhoda Grant was making about... Uh, about uh, talking about rather than... Uh, well, uh, you know, people operate businesses from houses these days. Uh, if they have access to broadband, of course, which is a problem we'll come on to, I guess, but... <laughs> Um, but, you know, some of that, if people have a house and they have their own home, then they can do lots of things. And many, many people, of course, run businesses from homes. But I accept the general point about, uh, uh, about business support. Um, the Crofting Agricultural Grant Scheme will provide £2 million assistance in 1617, helping an estimated 800 crofters each year invest in agriculture. The Crofting Cattle Improvement Scheme, that's the bull hire scheme, offers subsidised rate for crofters to hire bulls, and that in itself has been the subject of a lot of debate and parliamentary time over the years, rightly so, to protect that scheme from, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, from the threats of extinction from, from wheresoever those threats come, I do not know, but, uh, but plainly I mention that today because you know, we recognise it performs a, a, a valuable uh, role and the Crofters and Smallholders Skill Boost in 216 to 219 is a new three year project to increase primary agricultural skills for 1,200 participants. And that's for existing and incoming Crofters because, you know, we also want, and I guess, I, I, again, I know Rhoda Grant and John Finney and his, and his colleagues and uh, colleagues in my own party have been wanting to see how we can attract more entrants in. If they come in, obviously, they need to have s skills. and if I could praise the work that the SRUC and Lantra do, and I spoke, I think, at a Lantra event at the RHS fairly recently. So, um, a, I, I obviously, I'm just not able to give a full answer to the, the question, although I've covered some of the specific schemes that we're introducing. Some of them will meet the category of business, some will cross-cut, some will not. Uh, but, I, but I will ask my officials to go back and see if I've missed out anything. Uh, and I'm always happy to receive constructive suggestions about what more we can do to support crofting in Scotland. So please, uh, uh, please don't be shy. OK, I, th I think that uh, concludes the questioning on, on crofting. I, I'm going to admit now to making a mistake, which is a very dangerous one, which was to ignoring the deputy convener who should have come in before the section on crofting. Uh, so I apologise on record uh, and now give her a chance to ask her question. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, 
There are a number of changes for the legislation through the Land Reform Act, but I believe that you have um, a number of uh, responsibilities in your portfolio, namely for the tenanted farming sector and the agricultural holdings. Um, so I'd just like to ask a couple of questions in relation to these, and obviously they're widely welcomed by the tenanted sector. Um, what specific objectives the government has for the sector does it wish to see an increase in the area of tenanted land, and if so, by how much? What the timetable is for appointing the tenant farming commissioner? What the timetable is for bringing forward the secondary legislation on agricultural holdings that's in the Land Reform Act? And what plans the government has to address the recommendations from the Agricultural Holdings Legislation Review Report and the RACI Committee Stage 1 report that were not taken forward in the Land Reform Act? Thanks. Um, well, thank, thank you very much, and it's, it's, it's uh, well, I wasn't actually, but I always rely, I always rely on civil servants to, to, to do that, but it's, it's, uh, it's nice to see Gail here today, and uh, could I respond, re respond by saying that, first of all, we obviously want to see a, a vibrant tenant farming sector. I think that's a shared objective uh, for many years, a, a, including... Uh, it really encompassing, I think, all parties, to be fair, although there's very different views about how that should be achieved. So we do want to see the tenant farming sector succeed, and, um, and we want to see opportunities for new entrants and other people who want to farm to be able to access tenant farming opportunities. And, uh, and uh, I had the pleasure of meeting about 10 new entrants under the Forestry Commission scheme at the Royal Highlands Show. Uh, and interestingly, some of the questions that they had were about access to finance. In other words, questions which were not perhaps so directly related to farming, but more general running a new business, which you would expect. Uh, and it was an extremely useful discussion. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I must say that the Royal Bank, who took part in that discussion, uh, immediately offered to provide individual help to the individuals involved, which would go beyond perhaps the, the normal approach to small businesses. So I'd place on record my thanks to the Royal Bank for that immediate offer of support. Um, but we'd like to see new entrants. We'd like to see progression routes for people tied into grazing lets, um, uh, which provide insufficient business development opportunities. We want to enable those whose business is a combination of both rented and owned to make the best use of land to strengthen their business. Um, we want to provide those tenant farmers who want to leave the sector with the right opportunities to enable them to do so in a fair way to all concerned. So, you know, we, we want to see, above all, the, the use of the land in Scotland maximised. Uh, and I would like to see, convener, and whether we see this uh, we, is, uh, remains to be seen, but I would like to see the, the two sectors of landowners and, and tenants uh, continue to work together uh, and to reach an agreement, the, the objective of which is to see as much activity in Scotland in the rural economy uh, and the encouragement of, of new tenanted arrangements um, wherever that is appropriate and possible. Now, there was various other questions which um, I'm going to be reminded of in a moment, but I think one of them was the um, timetable for bringing forward the secondary legislation, uh, and I'm able to tell the committee that a number of commencement packages will be brought forward to implement the agricultural holdings provisions of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016. It's the intention that the first package will be brought forward before Parliament this autumn and will be followed by the second package. The first commencement package will deal with the sections on widening assignation and succession rights for tenant farmers. Uh, and I know that my officials are due to meet with the clerks of this committee and two other committees tomorrow to discuss the timetabling. And we will then publish our intended approach on our website, along with advice for tenant farmers and their landlords on how best to plan for the forthcoming uh, legislative changes. And I'm aware that there are a number of significant pieces of work that will have to be borne in mind and carried out uh, by tenant farmers in particular uh, in relation to, I think, the amnesty provisions. Uh, uh, and uh, we uh, are, are therefore keen to, uh, to uh, ensure that we provide as much clarity to the uh, tenant farming community and uh, everybody else as to what is required and we will, that will be very much part of our timetable. Um, and I will be writing to, the, to this committee during recess to set out our intentions for the implementation of the rent review system, 
which will include information about how we're approaching the necessary testing of the system to ensure that it's uh, fit uh, for um, purpose. The legislation that was passed in the last session of Parliament moves to a test which includes assessing the productive capacity of, uh, the, uh, of uh, the holding. And all stakeholders have stated in public that it's vital that the extensive testing system of the new rent system is carried out to ensure it's fit for purpose prior to um, commencement. And this committee, in its previous life, in the last session, indicated it would want to consider carefully the new system uh, to when it was brought forward. And I'm looking forward... I'm sorry, this is a long answer, but there were several questions. I'm looking forward to working fully with the committee about all of these matters in the way that those members who were closely involved in the legislation, and I was not actually one of them, but I've been swatting up on it, I will be fully involved. And lastly, can I say that I've already met with the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association and Scottish Land and Estates, uh, and uh, I'm aware that their members actually did quite a lot of work together, which is a good thing, to see if they can find as much agreement as possible in an area which is highly sensitive, highly controversial, but where I think the ultimate objectives of the best usage of land convener uh, are pretty widely shared. I hope that answers all the questions, but I'm not quite sure. I, I think there was one uh, Cabinet Secretary that you, you might have missed, and that was about the appointment of the Tenant Farm Commissioner. A, well, the lead for the implementation of Part 2 lies with Rosanna Cunningham, but I will liaise with her uh, regarding this matter, and it's expected that the process of approving the Tenant Farming Commissioner as a ministerial appointment will take place in the autumn of this year. I think... Um, Rosanna discussed this with the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee yesterday and the detailed involvement of Parliament is likely to be confirmed after the summer recess following further discussions between government and Parliament officials. Thank you. Any, uh, no. I, I think the, it, it's quite clear that this is going to form a, a major part of our business um, and unless there are any other questions... And considering the shortness of time, I'd like to move on to the next question, which is on forestry. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, just uh, by way of context, forestry is uh, obviously a very important uh, uh, industry for many quite remote and sparsely populated rural communities uh, providing uh, local jobs. And in that context, I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, are we still confident that we can plant uh, 100,000 acres of uh, forestry in the 2013-22 period, which has been uh, the stated aim for some time? Uh, and related to that, the, the last uh, forum forestry strategy was published in 2006. Um, I wonder what progress there is in uh, considering uh, any new strategy that may update that now a decade-old strategy. Uh, well, first of all, um, we are absolutely committed to achieving the target. The target hasn't been achieved. Uh, the target is ambitious. I think it's welcomed by other parties, uh, and it's 10,000 hectares uh, uh, of uh, uh, 10,000 hectares per annum has been the target, and 100,000 hectares of trees between 212 and 222. Um, so we're absolutely committed to planting more trees, and I've had meetings with uh, senior people in both the Forestry Commission, Forest Enterprise, the Scottish Government. I'm due to meet uh, uh, representatives of the forestry private sector, uh, a, a Stuart Goodall and David Sulman, I think. Um, and uh, I'm determined to work public and private sector together to achieve the target. Um, the industry, the forestry sector as an industry, it turns over £1,000 million a year. It's a great Scottish success story. Many of the leading companies started off as family companies. They're rooted in rural Scotland. They're not about to leave any time soon. They deserve our support. They will get our support. They uh, and the public sector must play a part in uh, increasing the plantings. And I'm having a meeting, a further meeting about that uh, later uh, today. And of course, forestry is a resource that also provides recreation and biodiversity and contributions to climate change and the planting of more trees is a substantial contribution to that issue as well. So uh, I have been involved over the years in, in this as an issue in various ways. 
I am absolutely delighted to, to have the, the opportunity now in this post convener to drive forward uh, this, and I think that there are a great many opportunities in the processing sector, uh, in the construction industry, in the use of wood in Scotland, uh, which is uh, commonplace in many other European countries, involving the university sector, which have done a huge amount of research in things like off-site construction, uh, which, uh, given the Scottish weather, is a, is, a, is a pretty sensible idea. And in many other areas, I think we haven't reached the potential of forestry uh, we have some of the best people in the world involved in it in the public and private sector uh, and uh, I, I intend to give a lead to all of this work and again I'd be happy, delighted to have uh, the full involvement of this committee towards achieving that uh, and these objectives. Um, I'm just mindful of the time and, and, and there are a lot of questions and so could I ask members of the committee because I don't want to miss anyone out at the end especially those that have been waiting specifically on questions to try and keep their questions as short as possible. Peter. Uh, thanks Governor Sigurd. I just would like to push you a bit more. I mean you say you're committed to the 10,000 hectares per annum planting target but I mean, we've failed miserably in the last few years to, to achieve that. We've, we've only done roughly half that uh, over the last uh, number of years. And I just wonder if you can be a bit more specific in how you intend to hit the targets in the future. Um, well, first of all, we created 4,600 hectares of woodland in 2015-16. And this compared to 700 hectares in England and 100 in Wales. So... Um, Scotland has created 83% of new woodland in the UK in 2015 and 16. And secondly, we have by far the most ambitious target. I mean, Mr Chapman is absolutely right. The target hasn't been achieved. How are we going to achieve that? Well, we need to find ways looking at the administrative system, looking at the grant system, looking at the overall funding, looking at the way in which the work is done and by whom. Uh, we uh, need to encourage investment. We need to work with public-private sector collaboration as we do at the moment, and deepen and strengthen that. Uh, and all of that is designed to secure more planting of trees. But it's also combined, if I may say so, convener, this is extremely important, to a related issue. Um, that is that there is um, an increased demand for forestry. And I'm trying to remember the exact figure, but I, th I think that the consumption of forestry is now about 8 million tonnes. And I think I'm right in saying, and I'll check these in case... I've misremembered this, that that output of 8 million tonnes is about twice that it was 15 years ago, which in itself is an indi indicator of success. Now, why is that? Well, it's because, you know, companies like uh, James Jones and BSW and Gordon's and my constituency and others have been really com commercially successful investing in uh, modern com computer automated equipment to get every single piece of a tree cut, not wasting anything. Secondly, it's been because of the success of our biomass sector in Scotland, encouraging the use of appropriately locally located biomass schemes, uh, especially in the Highlands and Islands. So that creates more demand. And thirdly, the panel products sector, uh, with a, a big investment in, in my constituency, as the convener well knows, £95 million pounds to replace their existing, uh, the, their existing um, a facility there, uh, will create a huge extra demand because their output is going from about 400,000 tonnes a year to 600 or 800,000 tonnes a year. So we have the existing demand and we're talking about a commercial activity here. The problems of forestry and harvesting are, A, the price of wood has been relatively low and therefore it's difficult to stimulate the market, but that has been addressed by stimulating the market through biomass and through panel products. Secondly, the inaccessibility of many of the mature trees that are ready to be harvested but cannot be economically harvested because of insufficient roads or single-track roads or a combination of the two, and therefore access to uh, the timber has been a problem. Increased activity uh, means in itself, and I've, I was told this by the owners and the investors, the ultimate owners actually, Brookfield, a company owned in Canada, making this investment in Scotland, um, that the radius from which trees will, for the Dow Cross plant, be taken will widen because they're increasing their output by two to 400,000 tonnes or something of that order. So, you see, this is, in response to your question, Mr Chapman, the way I see that is very much 
uh, myself as the public sector leader working very carefully with the commercial side very closely in order to see how working with them we can work towards meeting our targets and it is a challenging task i don't think it will be achieved in the, in the, in the first few few years uh, necessarily but uh, we but we will see i will come back to the committee i uh, hopefully prove myself wrong of what i've just said there but it but it is a target i think that we are you know certainly work towards uh, and uh, i think the opportunities to achieve it uh, are there commercially unless of course if we have no access to the eu as a result of the decision taken by the good people of England, uh, then, of course, what will happen to all these good things, all this investment by companies made in Scotland? You know, that is the threat that, that has existed since last Friday, I'm afraid to say. But, you know, we will be positive. We will play the cards as they fall, uh, and we will advance Scotland's interest and continue to do so, especially in the forestry sector, where there's tremendous opportunities ahead. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I'm hastened or maybe chastened for saying to you after your kind words at the beginning and welcoming me, if we can keep the answers as short as possible, because there are a lot of people around this table who are desperate to get questions in and have, have sat um, uh, round waiting. So I'm going to skip one of the questions, which is on fisheries, because it is a big subject, and I would ask if the Cabinet Secretary would be happy to respond to questions that we submit in written form after this meeting that we've been unable to raise at the meeting. And I'm afraid fisheries uh, will have to be one of them. Uh, the next person uh, to ask a question is the Deputy Convener on Food and Drink. Um, one of our favourite subjects, I'm sure. Um, in our manif manifesto, uh, we did commit to bringing forward a Good Food Nation Bill. Can you tell me what's likely to be included in that bill and when it is likely to be introduced? Uh, well, I think we, we have, um, uh, as Gail Ross alludes to, achieved uh, extraordinary success in promoting Scotland's high quality food and drink. And um, the target that we set, that was set by my predecessor, was achieved years in advance. And I'd just like to pay tribute to Richard Lockhead for his championing of the sector, in particular, to enormous success and really harnessing the spirit of Scotland. Uh, it's not all about signing cheques for grants and loans. It's about harnessing the spirit of Scotland in an area where we have so much to offer and really the, the, uh, the way in which Scotland is seen as, as a high, high, quality, high quality food and drink promoter, exporter, has radically changed over the past decade. That's a great thing that we've achieved under the powers that this Parliament has with the leadership of, of Richard. So, uh, so uh, uh, we are determined to carry on this work and we're going to consult on a Good Food Nation Bill in 2017, that's next year. And in doing so, what I hope to do is really build a cross-party and stakeholder consensus convener. What we want to do is to enhance the national food policy with the vision for Scotland to become a good food nation where people from every walk of life take pride, pleasure and benefit from the food they buy, serve and eat day by day. And work in shaping the course of this bill will involve colleagues and stakeholders in a number of areas across government, including health, food standards, waste, social justice, agriculture, education and procurement. And since I want to be brief, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you for being brief. Uh, connectivity uh, is the next question, which is obviously going to be a burning subject. Uh, Jamie, if I could ask you to lead on that, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, I do have an additional question, which I sub shall submit in writing around dairy farmers, of which I have some feedback from the industry from last week. I'll submit that in writing to the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Um, on connectivity, um, just a few very brief questions. Uh, is the target of 95% by March 2018 actually achievable? How the government will fund the remaining 5% uh, of people who are out with that target? And out of that 95%, how many of those will actually have access to speeds which meet the universal service obligation of 10 megabits per second? Um, okay, well, th thanks for that question. Um, I just want to say at the start that in my job title, there is the word connectivity. And the reason for that is that the First Minister has identified that making Scotland a digitally connected nation is uh, 
an objective that has moved away way up the political agenda. It's now at the top of the agenda. We must have connectivity in rural Scotland. We must have it. And that's the starting point, I think, I just wanted to make clear. Uh, and it's not an easy task, of course, particularly for those who live in the most remote parts of Scotland. That, that's absolutely the case. But we have set out an ambitious target once again, and we are determined to uh, achieve it. Uh, and a great deal of progress has, has been made with 410 million investment in the Digital Scotland Superfast uh, Broadband Programme, uh, which will deliver fibre broadband coverage to at least 95% of premises by the end of 2017. So um, we are, the deployment is progressing well. I can inform uh, uh, Mr. Green that by the end of March 16, the total number of premises that have access to fibre broadband was over 590,000. The programme has already met its initial coverage, of tar coverage target of 85% of the whole of Scotland six months ahead of schedule. But we want to reach 100% coverage, and so we are committed to delivering 100% super-fast coverage by 2021. Uh, 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 now, super-fast broadband, he mentioned 10 megs, but super-fast broadband in the context of our current broadband contracts is defined as being in excess of 24 megs. Uh, so that's different from what I gather to be the universal service obligation proposals in England, which is at 10 megs. So we are more ambitious than it would appear, our friends down south is, but I await clarification on what their eventual plan is going to be. Therefore, our commitment to provide 100% super fast coverage by 2021 will deliver solutions, should we succeed with this, far in excess of the minimum speed threshold currently proposed by the UK government for the USO. Oh, we're, we're more than on track. We're, we're ahead of track. We, you know, we're, uh, we've exceeded the initial target, I believe. But uh, we, we appreciate that, you know, if, if you haven't got broadband, it doesn't really matter. You're not going to be particularly assured by saying that your neighbour has got broadband or people that live in Glasgow or, or Edinburgh have got broadband, are you? And I'm sure all of us as representatives of people of Scotland receive a number of communications on a regular basis from people who who understandably uh, are, are very keen to, to promote this. There, there are a large number of technical ways in which particularly reaching out through Community Broadband, uh, Scotland and others, we, we plan to, to achieve the, the, uh, the target. Uh, the BT contracts in the Highlands and Islands reach 84%. The south of Scotland one is 96 So there is a bigger if you like, rural uh, um, proportion of people in the Highlands and Islands that will not get their coverage from the BT contract. And that means that the Community Broadband Scotland proposals, the, the other proposals, and Trudy Nicholson is familiar with all of these and could, could spell them out to the uh, committee if uh, the committee so wishes, um, will need to be deployed. And there are different options here. Uh, and I'm keen to, you know, to share with the committee not just make decisions, but share with the committee an approach to making decisions. And therefore, if the committee would like a briefing about these matters from Trudy Nicholson and her team, uh, and indeed from others such as uh, Stuart Robertson of HIE, who's, who's working this, the head of the contract there, then I would be happy to arrange that if, if the committee would be interested in that, because I think it's, it, the devil is very much in the detail here, uh, and I'm determined working with you to get this right. Sorry, that was slightly long. Uh, I think the devil is being in, in, in getting short answers uh, to, to short questions. So uh, without being rude, I, I, there are a lot of people who want to follow up on that. And again, I think we're going to have to follow up on that beyond the committee because there's three areas that I'd like to get very quick questions in. So we've covered the, the most of it. John wanted to ask a question on, on transport. And then I'd like to touch briefly on the Islands Bill and HIE, uh, please. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'll make a very short question on uh, emissions. Uh, what additional action will the Scottish Government take to reduce transport emissions in the coming years, please? Uh, well, I, th I think we, we have taken uh, a number of, of measures, uh, including promoting our walking and cycling plan, and there's been a very substantial increase in funding, I think from about 22 to 38 million, if those figures are broadly correct. Look at Mr. Carmichael. Um, we, uh, uh, so we, we do encourage and we have... Uh, we, we do encourage people to, to use alternatives other than the, the car, including uh, Shanks Pony, 
and the bicycle. Uh, we also, of course, are investing very substantially in rail transport throughout the country, not least in the, the Highlands, where the biggest ever investments for a century are being made in the Inverness to Perth and Inverness to Aberdeen lines. And around the country, there's a hugely ambitious investment programme in the, in the rail service. Um, I'm not, of course, directly responsible as the Minister for, uh, for, tack for, for tackling the climate change uh, issue. Uh, that is my colleague and friend Rosanna Cunningham. But I'm confident in the transport sec sector that we have been making significant progress. But of course, we, we're always uh, ready to, to see what other opportunities. We also, I, I think, have promoted electric cars and charging points throughout the country. And we've got the detail of this somewhere in these briefing notes. But, but I'll shut up there because I have to be brief. Thank you. Uh, Raider. Can I ask about the Islands Bill? What you're, when you're proposing to bring it forward and what do you propose to include in it? What powers will be set aside for islands specifically? Okay, well, if I can come back to the member, because I'm just not cited specifically on the precise answer to her question, uh, Rhoda Grant will be aware that, uh, that uh, Mr Yusuf is taking forward the, uh, the Islands Bill and I will write to her with the, the detailed re response because I just haven't... Uh, I've, I've got a big folder here, a lot of which I've... Uh, read uh, from quite early this morning, but that wasn't one of the, the bits. So, unless my officials can, uh, as a challenge to them, no, we haven't got the right officials here either. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> but we we will get get back to you. And if I could say that you know, um, we're determined to promote the economies of the islands. Uh, and one of the pieces of unfinished business, from my point of view, was to connect the islands to the national grid. Uh, that is very close to my heart and Rhoda's because, of course, for the Western Isles with so much fuel poverty, if we could harness the power of the wind and then use the financial gains from the power of the wind to end fuel poverty, which is within our grasp, if the UK government will just agree to complete the work that Ed Davey and myself did, uh, then that would be a terrific thing. So I think the Islands Bill will probably include uh, not just details and mechanics and mechanisms, but a vision for the kind of uh, the kind of progress we want to see in our islands, particularly uh, tackling fuel poverty in in uh, in uh, some of our some of our islands. And I know that Mr. Yusuf, uh, Mr. Wheelhouse are are well cited on these objectives. Thank you. We look forward to see receiving a uh, response to the committee on that. Uh, John has waited incredibly patiently, and uh, I'd like to give him the floor now, please. Okay, thanks. Just a very quick supplementary on the transport issue. I mean, you've got connectivity, a Cabinet Secretary, in your title. For us, connectivity means all the transport. Can you clarify for us how much you are responsible for transport? Um, well, um, uh, Mr Yusuf is responsible for transport other than trunk road construction programmes. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just being brief here. I can send the committee the formal list of competencies as uh, set out by the Scottish Government, so we will do that. But broadly speaking, uh, Mr Brown will deal with taking forward the, the, uh, the trunk road programme. Mr Yusuf deals with, uh, uh, with all of transport issues. I, of course, uh, uh, Mr Yusuf reports to me and I report to the Cabinet on all of the matters of transport for which Mr Yusuf is responsible. Now, on HIE, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, I understand there's a review going on at the moment, and that also covers Scottish Enterprise and some other bodies. And, I mean, I'm really just wondering where you think we're going with that uh, review, because I understand at the moment the remit of HIE is slightly different from the remit from Scottish Enterprise. Um, also, HIE, despite the fact you're the Minister for Rural Economy, HIE would include, uh, I think, some urban areas like uh, Inverness, and does not include other rural areas like uh, the south of Scotland. Uh, and it could appear to be just a little bit disjointed, the whole thing at the moment. How do you see that going forward? Um, well, the, the, the purpose of the review is to, is to look at the whole structure and uh, judge and assess how e effective it is. And that's not only at Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, but also includes other bodies such as Skills Development Scotland. Um, uh, and Mr Mason is quite right that HIE does have a slightly different role and function to Scottish Enterprise. It has a social remit for um, social development, which, as I understand it, is not part of the formal remit of Scottish Enterprise. It also has different limits in respect of assistance that it can provide, such as account management, which it does so at, at lower levels of turnover 
uh, of companies than would be the case for eligibility within the Scottish Act. So there are differences. Uh, the the uh, I, I do I do believe as uh, an Highland MSP for 17 years that HIE has uh, performed extremely well, uh, and uh, a, uh, and uh, I work and have worked and I, given I am responsible for HIE but not SE, I will continue work very closely with it. So I think the review is an opportunity to learn uh, how we can take the best of what we're doing at the moment and see whether that can be applied in other parts of Scotland, like the south of Scotland. And I'm aware from engagement with, for example, Borders Council uh, I, and a, a, from general work that I've done in the Borders and, and in Fries and Galloway as well, that uh, you know, we want to make sure that they are best served by the enterprise uh, economic development functions as well. So that, I think, is very much, uh, these are very much two aspects that we want to, what can we learn and if other rural areas maybe could be treated better in a sense, because it appears that rural areas in the Highlands under HIE get a bit more attention than rural areas that are not under HIE. Well, that, that may look to be the case on the face of it. Um, uh, you know, once you get down to, to individual villages and people living in individual villages, I'm not sure that everybody would necessarily agree with that, but, but that's life. But I mean, we want to, in this review, look at how we can get best practice everywhere in Scotland. And, and I just mentioned the south of Scotland because I'm aware that this is an argument that has been voiced by uh, Emma Harper and, and others as local representatives. So, so you know, we, we want to, to capture those views. And, and once again, I would reach out to members of this committee and their colleagues in various parties to play a part in this review. Thank you uh, very much, Cabinet Secretary. I wonder, if, just before we bring this session to a close, if there's anything that you'd like to add as a result of the questions. But before you do that, could I just clarify, there will be questions that we would like to submit in written form. And uh, I'm grateful for you acknowledging that you'll answer those uh, posts the committee. So is there anything you'd like to add as a result of the session this morning? Um, well, I think I've had ample opportunity to speak at great length, I have to say, which, of which I took full advantage. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I do look forward, though, to after 17 years of, of hearing the day when, when Mr. Uh, Mr. Stevenson's comments are very quick. Uh, but, but I'm sure they will always remain unpredictable so, and enjoyable. So on a serious note, I'd be very, very keen to continue to work with, with all of the committee uh, of whatever party over the next five years. And I think where where a Cabinet Secretary works well with a committee, shares information, provides briefings, uh, works in that kind of manner, I think that's really all for the best because whatever political differences we have, I think there's probably a lot more that actually unites us when it comes to driving forward the rural economy. Okay. Th thank you very much. And I, I'll, I'll take it from your comments that that, 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 uh, that allows me to sometimes chase you a little bit harder for shorter answers. But thank you very much for your time. Um, uh, we'll, there'll be a nice five-minute break, just a five-minute break now before uh, the next person comes in. Thank you.
Okay, the third item on the agenda then is evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for the, uh, for the economy, jobs, fair work and on projects, initiatives and developments within his portfolio and which relate to the committee's remit. So I welcome Keith Brown as Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. He's accompanied by David Klein, Project Project. Climey, sorry, I apologise, I've been corrected. That's the second time I've been corrected this morning. We'll try and improve. The project director of the fourth replacement crossing team and Graham Porteous, head of special projects, both from Transport Scotland. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. I won't uh, take long. I know you've had quite a lot of business already to deal with. Um, first of all, though, can I congratulate you on your appointment as Convener of this committee and to all the other members who've uh, been appointed to the committee. Um, and also uh, wish you well in scrutinising the Scottish Government on its rural economy and connectivity programme and policies. And I hope that today's session will further help clarify the split that exists in terms of portfolio responsibilities between uh, Fergus Ewing, who you've been speaking to, uh, Hamza Yusuf, and myself. Uh, my appointment, convener, as a dedicated Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, I think is, as much as anything else, intended to give a clear signal of the Government's focus on stimulating growth and protecting and creating jobs and on promoting Scotland as a great place to do business, none of which will be uh, deviated from as a result of recent events. We will listen carefully to businesses and search for constructive ideas about how they can support uh, economic growth. Uh, the Scottish Government, though, believes that uh, we have to recognise the essential role that transport in particular plays has to play in supporting our economy. So despite what have been pretty relentless budget cuts over recent years, both in terms of capital and in terms of revenue, uh, the Scottish Government is committed to the largest transport investment programme that Scotland has ever seen, worth over £16 billion pounds since 2007. And just to tie that into how it rel relates to the economy, obviously it's the case if you can improve your transport links, then you can improve the productive potential of the economy. Uh, and it's uh, that part of the um, uh, four eyes, if you like, that we are uh, focusing on the infrastructure side of it in relation to transport. I think Fergus Ewing will have said to you already this morning that in relation to last week's vote, uh, it's our view the Scottish Government has to be fully and directly involved in any and all decisions about the next step that the UK Government intends to take following the EU referendum result. And that's to ensure that any exit which may happen would not have an impact on existing or planned major projects. And just worth mentioning in passing that I think most of the major projects which we are involved in employ a substantial number of EU nationals from out with the UK. Uh, I'll give a quick update if I can, Convener, on the major transport projects. In March, I made a joint announcement with the UK Minister for Transport, uh, welcoming the publication of HS2 broad options for upgraded and high-speed railways to the north of England and Scotland. Uh, a steering group is now being created to progress with the ultimate aim of delivering a three-hour rail journey time between Scotland and London and on easing the severe congestion on cross-border routes. As far as the Queen's Ferry crossing is concerned, uh, and as I announced to this Parliament on the 8th of June, it's now expected to be fully open to traffic by mid-May 2017. The project is not late. We have not, um, we're not going to be able to meet our target date of the end of this year, but the project itself is not late, and the revised completion date will have no impact on the budget. Uh, a technical briefing was held for MSPs by the FRC project team on the 10th of June, and that's now been shared with your clerking team. Uh, the Queen's Ferry Crossing is one of the most technically challenging building projects ever undertaken uh, in the world, and its location means it is very weather susceptible. And in my view, credit has to be given to the more than 1,200 people employed on the project and the work that they've done so far. Construction on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Routes and the Balmeri Tipperty project uh, is well underway, and the new roads are on programme to be open to traffic uh, in winter 2017, with the Crabston and Dice Junction scheduled to be open by autumn 2016. That project will provide substantial benefits across the whole of the North East and will provide a boost to the economy. It will increase business and tourism opportunities, improve safety, cut congestion, as well as increasing opportunities for improvements in public transport facilities. Uh, in our view, we uh, must remain steadfast in our commitment to upgrade Scotland's trunk road network, which includes dueling the entire length of the A96, some 86 miles of upgraded road between Inverness and Aberdeen by 2030. Uh, Transport Scotland has also just awarded a design contract worth up to £50 million to Mott Macdonald's Sweco joint venture 
to take forward the route option assessment of the western section, that's between Aldern and Fochabers. Uh, the route option assessment for the eastern section, Huntley to Aberdeen, is expected to commence uh, later this year, with the central section to follow in 2019. Uh, and as a result of that project, road users will not only enjoy the benefits of improved journey time and reliability, better connectivity between destinations, but also, and crucially, improved road safety for all those who use this key artery connecting two of Scotland's economic hubs. You'll know that one of the features of that road is the extent to which very different types of traffic use it, agricultural traffic, and, and the conflicts which can arise. Uh, estimated at £3 billion, the duelling of the A9 between Perth and Inverness represents the biggest transport investment in Scotland's history, uh, as well as the ongoing construction of the 7.5-kilometre King Craig to Dalradi scheme. We're working hard to identify preferred routes for the duelling schemes, having already let the public see the proposed designs for three sections earlier this year. And as we continue progressing design work, we'll be carrying out ground investigations across the programme over the next few months. Uh, the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvements project has already generated £226 million worth of investment in the economy through subcontracts and is providing employment to over 1,000 people. Significant progress has been made on the construction of the new M8 with major structures such as the North Calder Water Bridge and the Brayhead Rail Bridge at Bargeri now in place. And for those who have passed that route recently, the new route is clearly visible to regular commuters. Uh, tomorrow we'll see the closure of the B756 Bells Hill to Urringston uh, for approximately 11 days to carry out the widening of the M74 motorway bridge over this road. So with those uh, initial remarks, uh, Convener, I'm happy to try and answer the committee's questions. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, John, I think you're going to... Thank you. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, one of the less technical questions I had hoped to ask at the time of the ministerial statement, but wasn't called, with regard to the fourth replacement crossing, can you confirm whether the existing uh, commitments regarding the existing facilities um, continued use by public transport will still be honoured as a result of this delay? By that, do you mean that the existing bridge, the fourth road bridge, will be used as a public transport corridor? Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's, that's still our intention. I think we always have to keep an open mind in relation to those things, but nothing has changed from the original statement that that will be used uh, as a public transport corridor. And I suppose the thing that's changed um, or the incidents that's happened since we made that statement is, of course, the problems that we had with the bridge uh, most recently. Just to say in relation to that, we have, as well as repairing that fault and other aspects which might have had that vulnerability, we have done what's called a full health check on the bridge for the first time in, in that depth in many years, uh, and the bridge is in good condition. The biggest issue, of course, was the deterioration of the cables, which was the reason why back in 2005 we said that the new bridge should really try and be opened by 2017, because the experts have said that's when the... Um, the deterioration of the cables may have become crucial, such that HGVs would have to come off the existing bridge. That, that work has now been very successful, the dehumidification that's taken place in terms of the cables, so that is no longer the issue that it was, although it's still an issue we keep an eye on. So, the, notwithstanding the fact we've had that incident with the bridge, the work we've taken subsequently should secure the long-term future of the bridge, and it is our current intention, as stated previously, to use it as a public transport corridor upon the completion of the new bridge. OK, thank you very much indeed. Stuart. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, pleased to see you here, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I want to just explore a little bit of detail about the timescale uh, and what has caused the change. Now, I suspect it may be the project director who might want to answer this, uh, because I, I think it's important to allow the committee and the lay people that we of necessity are uh, an understanding of why a few days out of the schedule at one point lead to many months delay. Now, as someone who ran major projects, albeit in software, I, I think I know uh, because there presumably will be periods during which if we slip into them, there are activities can't be undertaken. I hypothesize, for example, you might not be able to so effectively lay asphalt in winter. Uh, but it would be helpful to have that understanding so that people can see why a few days lost lead to months <coughs> of the end date moving back. Can I say, first of all, that um, obviously David can comment on the, the comment about uh, Ashfield, but I think it is the case that when you lose the time that we lost 
in April and May such that you can't do the thing you intended to do on that day. It sometimes means that the things yep. you want to do the next day you can't do, and that's why you see yep. that um, effect um, running through the programme. I'm sure David could explain it much more carefully. And given the fact that David has been up and down the towers many times, maybe I can understand why the convener called him David Klein rather than David Kleimy, but uh, uh, David would know the, the detail of that. Can, I, can I just clarify? I wasn't identifying asphalt except as a hypothesis on my part. Okay, um, I think you've outlined the principle of it extremely well. Um, clearly, I mean, I think since um, September of last year, um, I've come to report to your, your uh, predecessor, the ICI committee, on a regular basis. Uh, when I came to see them in September last year, at that point, we were already, already saying, and as we'd had done consistently from the start of the project, that weather was always the biggest challenge. It's, it's an exposed location. We have some very technically complex operations to do out there. Um, so in September last year, we were at the point of saying uh, the contractor is now telling us they need to have a, an average winter. Um, I, when I came to report to the ICI committee again at the beginning of March, um, the way I characterised it then was things hadn't gone as well as we'd hoped, but at that point the contractor was still telling us it was doable, which I think was, was fair at that time. And I think that view was encouraged during March in that we had a particularly settled spell of weather. We put up 12 deck units in that period, and that seemed to suggest that we, we turned a corner and being optimistic, which I think is, was the right thing to do, and keep the, the uh, target very much in mind, the contractor said, yep, we, we can still get there for the end of the year. Um, April and May was a significant setback. Uh, we lost 25 days due to weather over that period of time, significantly more than we'd expected to do. And it's not just that the weather stops you working, but it loses the momentum as well in terms of the regular operations. Uh, the people go out there, they expect to do something. If they don't get it done, that has a knock-on effect. So what happens really is losing time in April, April, May means that a day lost at that point pushes the activities we'd expect to complete the debt lifting by around September. That pushes the end of the debt lifting back to about November. Now, November is a lot worse time out in the 4th than September is. So therefore, we can have deck units out there, but we might not be able to lift them. And as, and as, as an example, we had a, a day in May when we sent a deck unit out, we had to bring it back in again because the wind just wouldn't allow us to lift. We did that three days in a row before we finally got the, the deck able to be lifted. By November, we're also at the point where we have the longest cable stays to handle. And as they get longer, they get more difficult to handle. Uh, they're, they're obviously, clearly, they're longer. We have to use a crane. We have men in a man basket either side of the towers who are instrumental in actually installing those cables. And the baskets themselves are particularly wind sensitive and you get some acceleration effects of the wind around the towers. So those are all areas where the contractors gained knowledge and experience since they started the um, lifting of the decks back in September of last year. So in May, they came to us and said, look, we, we just don't think we can get there in December. And we challenged that very, very strongly, as you would expect us to, uh, because obviously it was important to try to hit the target. But looking at it in great detail, as we have with the revised programme, the other effect it has, as you did allude to, is the fact that we have a sequential series of operations. We have to finish erecting all the deck units. We can't start putting waterproofing and asphalt onto the bridge until all the deck units are lifted and the bridge is fully connected together. So that means that if we can't erect all the deck units until November, December, it puts us waterproofing and asphalting into January and February. And traditionally, that's not the time of year we'd want to be doing that sort of work in Scotland. And therefore, you have to build in additional time within the programme. And that, in a, in a short version, is how we go from what appears to be a 25-day delay to what the contractor's now saying mid-May. But I would emphasise that we're pushing the contractor very strongly to better that date if it possibly can be done. OK. Convener, thank you. OK. Um, Peter. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I'd like to ask a Cabinet Secretary about the pollution uh, uh, incident that happened in the AWPR. We had heavy rain. Sorry, can I, can I just stay on the, uh, the FRC for the moment? That, that, that's another section. You, you said you did have a question on the, the fourth road cross, uh, replacement crossing. Do you have a, Okay. Can, uh, sorry, my mistake. Then I'll, I'll, I'll go straight to Mike, if I may, and ask you to hold that Thank one you, at the moment. Um, Minister, you said the, the five-month delay in the completion date um, has no impact on the budget, which to me, um, as a layman, uh, begs the question about the original contract. If, it, if a five-month delay in em employment contracts, the cost of staffing, all the, every, the huge cost that is going to be involved, I just don't understand, because it hasn't yet been explained, um, why that has no impact on the Scottish budget. It begs the question, was the contract 
was it a good use of public money that the contract was made? Because there must be an awful lot of leeway in the contractor's profits here. Yeah, I'm struggling to detect a, a, a hint that you're happy that we're making in excess of a quarter of a billion pounds uh, reduction on the price, but that is the case, and we'll go through the technical reasons for it. Just to say that I think if you go back to the late 2000s, the estimated cost, going back to, in fact, the administration, a Labour and Lib Dem administration before 2007, the estimates were around £5 billion or so. Uh, and then, of course, there was a real urgency to crack on with this, and uh, various options are looked at, including the design and, and what we eventually came to, which managed to get the cost down to something we could afford. Just to remind you, the Scottish Government pays for this out of current budgets. There is no uh, assistance was given by Westminster in relation to borrowing. It's not the ideal way to have gone about this project, but such was the urgency uh, of the, the project that we did it in that way. We went out to tender, I think I'm right in saying the tender range for it was £1.75 to £2.25 billion. Pounds. Um, the bid came in below that. Uh, since then, because of progress that was made, we've managed to work down that figure such that the I think it's 200 and, I think 46, uh, 245 million. £245 million pounds less uh, or savings that were made from the original budget. That is a good thing, and I think points to very effective project control, and a, a very, admittedly, a very good bid in a time that was difficult for the construction industry. But as to, I, mean, I think it's generally a good thing that we've got that saving, but perhaps David would want to come back on the technical answer to, uh, to Mike Rumble's question. Certainly, just a, a little detail on that the contract that was awarded to Forth Crossing Bridge constructors, that was a, a lump sum fixed price contract with the only um, allowance for extras being inflation. Scottish ministers took the, the risk of inflation. So basically it was a £790 million lump sum fixed price contract only subject to inflation on top of that. Now that means that the contractor effectively takes the time risk. Uh, there was a, a set date in the contract for, for the completion of the work, which is, is June 2017, but there was always the ambitious target set, which the contractor felt they could meet, of December 2016 for having traffic onto the bridge. So they've already allowed for the fact that the contract itself runs to June 2017, and they've allowed for that within, within all their budgets. So what is not changing is the contract period, that remains exactly as it was, and how the contractor administers their finances within that contract period is, is entirely for the, for the contractor. There's, there's no option for them to sort of come to, back to us as a client to, to seek more money. Yeah, I'm just was making no political point at all, I'm just generally trying to find mm. out from a layman's perspective why that occurred, but your explanation to me is, is a good one, and um, I just wanted to assure you that that was the case. I'm just trying to find out because as a layman, I didn't quite understand if there was a five-month delay, how it wasn't costing any more money and, and the profit of, of the original company. So they must be still be making a substantial profit, I would, Im would imagine. But that's for them. I, it's yeah. for, I would just say that I think the key point that David responded to was on the inflation thing, because unusually, mm -hmm. because of the way we went about this project, and it's not true uh, so much of other projects, that the government took the inflation risk, and of course you've seen what's happened mm -hmm. in terms of inflation, so that has been part of what's there, but it's locked in now, so that saving won't be changed, mm -hmm. and any additional costs that will um, accrue come down to the contractor. Sorry, I'd just like to ask is, is that now that we're going into a potentially another winter working scenario with the uh, added risks and problems with working in the winter when we've had two fairly benign winters oh. with, without uh, anything but strong winds, is first of all, that you, are you absolutely convinced that uh, there is going to be no pressure put on the safety of the workers by working during the winter and that you are still, having borne that in mind, going to be able to complete the bridge on the timescale that you've given? Uh, yes, just to say, first of all, convener, that uh, the point about safety is, uh, is a critical one. Uh, and uh, apart from the tragic death that we had uh, most recently, a, a, an excellent safety record has been applied. And I know that from Transport Scotland, but also from the contract, and in particular Michael Martin, who heads up the... Uh, in, entire project, uh, an absolute commitment to safety. And I've seen it every time I've gone uh, to the bridges as well, whether you're going by uh, dinghy to get to the towers or however you're uh, accessing the site, they're very, very strong on safety. And we have made clear to Transport Scotland that they also should make clear to the contractor, as we have done, that safety has got to be uh, the first consideration. Interestingly, Michael Martin, who, as I say, heads up, very experienced individual, when he, he meets every new start that comes to the project, and he's often asked uh, in those discussions about 
is the big target here to get this done by a certain date and a certain price. You know, the big target is to get this done safely. So there's a, a, an institutional, cultural commitment to safety, and we will not apply any pressure to jeopardise that. Having said that, having explained that to the contractor, not that I think that we had to, but they understand that, they have said that the mid-May date that they've given us for next year is achievable. Now, the reason why, and I have to take what they tell me, I'm not going to make a commitment to the public or to this committee that's not based on what I'm told by the contractor. Um, they have the benefit now of the experience. I, I'm told it may surprise people. It's a real learning curve um, for them because there, there are not that many comparable projects like this. So they've learned a great deal in terms of the weather, some of the stuff to do with deck lifting, the cables and so on, which gives them more confidence in their ability to project forward. So that is the estimate given to the contract that we will be applying pressure to make sure that date is is met, of course we are, that's our job to challenge, but it will not be in the basis, and it will specifically be on the basis that there is no question of jeopardising the safety of anybody on the site. I don't know thank if thank you for that. Uh, if we can move on to the uh, Aberdeen uh, Western Periphery Road. Okay. Can we, I'll go back to where we were. Um, I was asking the question about this, the uh, heavy rain we had in the AWPR, which resulted in pollution coming off the site and uh, suspension of work for, for seven days. Um, and my question really is, can you provide an update on the pollution incident that did occur? And uh, as I say, it resulted in the suspension of work for a week. And what action is being taken so that that will not occur again? And whether or not the, you know, we, we, we're facing a, a similar overrun that was seen with the bridge where you lose a week uh, but it maybe overruns uh, considerably more at the at the end of the project. So I would, I would uh, you know, it's, it's just an update of where we are, whether it's likely to happen again, and what uh, what it will ha effect it will have on the the end date for the the whole project. Uh, thanks for that. I think it's worth saying that although SEPA, of course, were involved in this because of the um, effects of the very heavy rainfall uh, which happened, uh, the decision to. Um, suspend um, work was taken by the contractor in this case, but working very closely with ourselves uh, and with SEPA. And as you'll know, I'm sure very well, it's not just this recent period of heavy rain that we've had in the North East. It's been a, a factor now for a number of months, going back to last year as well, where we've had uh, very heavy rain. Um, however, I would say that some of the same concerns in relation to the Queen's Ferry crossing don't apply in relation to this. still a very complex project with the bridges uh, and different sections of road uh, and the route that's been proposed still very trying, but it doesn't have the same kind of sequential effect uh, in the way that you might uh, think in terms of the fourth road crossing. For example, at the kind of sharp end of the fourth crossing, you've often got two people working in a very confined space and you've got to try and there's not much you can do to influence that to speed it up, if you like, because of the constraints here. That is not the case in relation to the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. So it is the case where they do experience delays, as has happened in this case. They have the opportunity through applying uh, additional resources, which they have done, to catch up that time. But perhaps it would be useful to hear from Graham Porteous, who will be more familiar with the detail of it than I am. Yeah, the contractor uh, volunteered to stop work in order to, to make sure that the mitigation that he had in place was increased. And in working hand in hand with SEPA, they have now uh, gone back and reviewed the whole of the site and are starting up in an incremental process again, working in various places, provided SEPA are happy that the mitigation is secure and safe. Um, the Cabinet Secretary is correct, they can introduce more staff, it's not a sequential operation. Uh, therefore, at this point in time, uh, as far as we're aware, the contractor has, has had no impact on their programme. Can I ask if there's been any uh, impact on any of the uh, Schedule 1 species uh, within, within the river? I think we'd have to check that and write back to you, convener, on that particular issue, if that's okay. okay. Uh, any other questions on that road? Uh, well, now I'm going to let uh, Richard have the floor a wee bit because he's been sitting very patiently because he had a, a series of questions he'd like to ask on the M74. So. Yeah, thank you, Ken, uh, Kendina, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as a constituency member for Irvington and Bell, so the M8, the M73 and M74 either run through my area or uh, runs along the border. We have a particular problem. Can I say, uh, firstly, I welcome the, the money being spent and the jobs being created and uh, welcome uh, what has been done uh, by SRP, Scottish Road Partnership. But I have to say that there has been a problem 
with the Scottish Roads Partnership in um, communication with my constituents along the M74, particularly uh, just after the Hamilton services, where uh, it backs on to houses where we're now extending the road on to, to widen the road. Um, we're taking a lot away a lot of trees, a lot of foliage, we're going nearer to the houses and we're causing uh, uh, complaints of noise, cracking uh, um, in, in the buildings. Uh, I know that several people have been in contact and I, before the election, actually had a meeting along with constituents with SRP. And at that time, it was agreed that we continue to update us. I am not getting the updates that I want and, and need. And also, we also have the particular problem where I think the one and only that I know of, and you may correct me, primary school that runs immediately next to the M74, you are now coming nearer to that primary school and it's being highlighted by the, the teachers and I actually went down to the school and uh, I've organised and asked uh, uh, Hamza Yusuf to come along and visit it with me and he has agreed to do so and I'm sure you'll check that that is done. Um, but we have a situation where the Sir John uh, Baptist Primary School in Nuringston uh, is indicating a danger of if a car comes off, uh, the road is slightly, the school is down at the bottom, the road is slightly higher, and if a car came off that road, uh, it could fly into the, um, unfortunately, into the playground. The, the school has taken the, the situation to remove the children from that play, that part of the play area, playground in the school, to other parts, but they still are asking for uh, some form of fencing or higher fencing and ac across the whole route from the, the Hamilton Services Wraith Interchange to um, certain parts say, um, uh, along that route, uh, residents are asking for uh, uh, sound barrier um, uh, uh, implementation of fencing, etc., or some form of uh, sound barrier uh, mitigation because of the factor that now, because you've re removed all the vegetation, all the trees, uh, the noise is getting beyond what was said was going to happen. I do apologise for a long question. Uh, can you give me a, an assurance, an update on what's happening in the gas dams on the floor? Uh, yes, can I say first of all that the issues which you've raised uh, have been raised before, both by yourself and by other members, uh, and have been investigated previously. I've certainly asked Transport Scotland about these, who in turn have spoken to the contractor and received assurances. I think what I'm getting from the questions which are now being asked is that assurance is not proven to give the uh, degree of assurance to uh, your constituents, uh, as you've mentioned. Now, what I would say is if there's been... Uh, a, a falling off in the updates and we'll make sure that is rectified although it's I think only a month since I've been in post but um, we'll make sure that the regular updates that you experienced before are continued and also in relation to the meeting that you mentioned as well um, well whether it's Hamza or myself uh, we will make sure that meeting goes ahead it's very important to keep that uh, that kind of dialogue and communication open the estimates which have been done in relation to barriers, uh, either sound or physical barriers, for other reasons, have been pretty technical and have been pretty stringent and they've been re-examined since. But given what you say about the continuing concerns, I think it's only right that we continue to have that uh, dialogue. So the meeting will go ahead and the updates will continue and we'll keep the dialogue going as we go forward with this project. Uh, I, I welcome that assurance and, and, and I'm satisfied with that. Can I also turn this through you, convener, to... It's something that's come out of the blue, um, a new trunk road. I'm, I'm all for road building in, in, in some ways and, and to improve roads, but uh, in my area, um, in my constituency, through Hollytown, there has now a, come out of the blue a, a proposal to build a, a connecting trunk road from Hollytown Road through to Eurocentral. My view is that the M8, the M74, the, the Hollytown uh, bypass... Uh, is sufficient in order for traffic and lorries, etc., to get into Eurocentral. And basically, that's the views of my constituents. Now, uh, uh, as I say, completely left field, uh, um, there has been a, a proposal to build a new trunk road from Hollytown Road into Eurocentral. I uh, can have a discussion with your officials later uh, to go over it if you don't know exactly where it is. Uh, and this is causing quite a lot of concern in the Hollytown area, especially with residents who believe that 
And, and we all know what happens with sat navs. Big lorries uh, go the shortest route and basically gets to a situation where I'll, I'll, I'll brief it. Um, can I have a, 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 a look at this uh, problem also, please? In the interest of brevity, convener, I will ensure that you get a response from the officials, but just to say that any new road um, does not just happen. So any proposal for a road will go through all the statutory process. There's no question that if there's a new road affecting your constituents that they won't get the chance to have their say in that. So I can make that assurance, and as I say, I'll make sure the officials write to you with the latest up-to-date position in relation to the issue you raise. Um, when I said you could have the floor, I didn't realise it was for such a long time. I, I have learned something uh, at this meeting. I, I'd like to just take a moment to pause and, and welcome the MPs from Sri Lanka uh, to the committee meeting. You're, you're very welcome. Um, so having dealt quite exhaustively uh, on the M74, I wondered if we could go on to uh, a question on uh, Presswick uh, Airport. Thank you. Jamie. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, if I may just clarify on the M8 uh, work, uh, do you have a very brief idea of when that will be finished? Anyone who does the commute from the West Coast to Edinburgh will know how horrendous it's become. Uh, it would be really great to get an idea of when that will all be finished. Well, first of all, to say it's a bundle of different works. So we've got the Wraith Interchange, for example, the M8, the M74, M73, and the scheduled uh, completion date was 2017 next year. So that's uh, when they... But they may well be finishing at different points before that period as well. OK, thank you. Uh, on Presswick Airport, I wonder if you could clarify the Scottish Government's view on uh, the current performance of Glasgow Presswick Airport, predicted performance, and whether you still intend to return the airport to private sector ownership or any uh, general comments you'd wish to make on Glasgow Presswick Airport to the committee. Hey, can I say in relation to, first of all, one of the questions you asked, which is whether it's our intention to return it to private ownership. We did acquire the um, airport on that basis. That was our intention. We made very clear in public statements uh, repeatedly that that would be potentially a long-term um, aspiration given where the airport was when it was acquired. Um, a lack of investment for many years, uh, tailing off in passenger numbers. Um, and so we understood that was a long-term project. And what we're doing now is putting in place uh, the necessary arrangements to allow the airport itself to go forward, try and recover the passenger situation. It's it's an atypical airport, as I'm sure you're aware, mm. in terms of the different activities which go on at the airport. So whether it's the uh, maintenance and repair of aircraft, whether it's um, uh, some of the other activities which go on around about the airport, um, it's not quite typical. And of course, the uh, other aspect, of course, has been the interest from Presswick uh, in a potential spaceport, which has perhaps changed a bit given the UK government's announcement about how they intend to go about um, allowing uh, or licensing potential spaceports as well. So a very challenging situation, but just to repeat what we said at the time, it was absolutely crucial for us to acquire that based on the impact that would have happened in the Ayrshire and West of Scotland economy had we not done so. But it is our long-term aspiration to return that back to the private sector. Do you have a potential timeline on that? Sorry. Um, I, I, I'm mindful also of, of, of the time, if you may. I just may. think the, the term long term is, is very open ended. It'd be great to. Yeah, uh, and I, 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 sorry, I can't be more specific than okay, that. Thank you. Um, Emma, and, and I'm afraid you're going to be the last question. Okay, I'll be really quick then. Um, I'm aware that there is uh, an opportunity to look at feasibility for the Borders Railway extension and also some developments in Stranraer Harbour. I'm just wondering um, if you have any updates on Mr Swinney's promise when he was uh, Cabinet Secretary to hold a transport summit in Dumfries and Galloway. Yes, I think, uh, I'm going from memory here, but I think John Swinney has made the uh, statement that he will continue with that commitment um, to have that uh, transport summit. I think he himself, I could be wrong on this, but I think he personally wants to remain involved in relation to that. So. Uh, but whether it's John Swinney or somebody else, that, that, that is going to go ahead. In relation to the Borders uh, Railway feasibility study of the extension, again, that was a commitment made by the First Minister, in fact, indeed made in the, uh, in the election, to have that feasibility study. We had said previously we will support the Council and other interested bodies should they want to continue that, should they want to have a feasibility study for the continuation of the Borders Rail. Uh, and I think we've now gone further and answered we will make sure a feasibility study uh, happens. So that commitment remains and work is ongoing within Transport Scotland to see how that's best done. But just to say, just at the last point, that um, the Borders Railway itself shows how hugely beneficial to local and rural economies it can be if we can invest in infrastructure like that. Thank you. Uh, just uh, 
Mr Brown, is there anything further you'd like to say? There, are, I, I would hasten to add there are a lot of questions that, that potentially could have been asked and due to the shortness of time, it's not been possible to get them in. So we would like to submit those as written questions and would ask that you respond to uh, the committee with answers to those questions as, as soon as possible. But is there anything further you'd like to add? Just one point, of course we will respond uh, in writing to the other questions which haven't had the chance to be asked, but to say that, uh, and I'm sure that David Climey will recoil in horror as I say this, but uh, if the committee would wish to do as its predecessor committee did, to visit the Queen's Ferry Crossing, then I'm sure that can be accommodated. I should update the committee that I have had as yet no response to my uh, offer to Murdo Fraser to come to the top of the towers uh, at the uh, bridge, but if this committee... Uh, in all seriousness, wants to actually visit, and I know the previous <coughs> members have done that, you can get a real appreciation of what's going on on site. Of course, we'll do that in a way that doesn't impede progress, but uh, happy to make that offer to the committee. Uh, I, I'm sure we'll, we'll consider it, and I'm sure that uh, I will be refusing to go to the any top of any towers, however badly my mispronunciation of your name was. But thank you very much for the offer, and I'm sure we'll consider it. Um, that concludes this part of the today's meeting. I'd like to suspend the meeting just to allow the committee to move into private session, if I may, please. Thank you.